This is the former Tony and Susan Alamo Christian Foundation Complex in Crawford County. The mansion, while vacant, remains intact. Personal touches are all around. At one time, hundreds lived on the grounds, most working at this building where Alamo's jackets were made. Brenda Morell grew up in Dyer. She remembers when the Alamos came to town in 1975. They came in and they had so many businesses. They had gas stations. Um, they had a, a concrete plant that they built. Um, but they had a restaurant, a pretty nice restaurant, and they had stars. They had big names come in, like Merle Haggard. Um, supposedly Elvis came. Back then, residents were told the land would be used as a rehabilitation site. And that was the purpose of them setting this up, is to bring in people off the street and, and uh, get them off the The federal government seized the property in 1991. Alamo had already skipped town. Before we get into today's video, I did just want to go ahead and let you know that I'm just putting part one and part two together into one video in case anyone doesn't want to watch the two parts separately. So if there are any weird cuts or anything like that, it's because I'm just putting part one and part two together. But without further ado, let's get into today's video. We're Tony and Susan Alamo, the Tony and Susan Alamo Christian Foundation. Stay with us for the next half hour. We have our choir, our orchestra, gospel testimonies, gospel songs, and a message from my sweet little angel wife that I'm sure you won't want to miss. You know, she's a little thing, but she's sure got a great big message. You know, she's a little thing, but she's sure got a great big message. Tony Alamo and the Alamo Christian Foundation may or may not be names that you know or have even heard of. If you've been around my channel for long enough, you probably already figured out that Tony Alamo and his foundation were anything but wholesome and good. In my opinion, Tony Alamo was a cult leader. If you've ever seen the jackets that are currently on the screen that have been worn by celebrities such as Michael Jackson, Dolly Parton, Miley Cyrus, and Nicki Minaj, well, those were made by Tony's followers, and said followers didn't get paid for their work. Children worked on these jackets as well because their small fingers could place all of the Swarovski crystals on it, but that's not even the worst of it. Tony would eventually go on to have child brides as well. In today's video, part one, I'll be going over Tony and Susan Alamo, the rise and fall of their cult, while part two will go over stories told by some of the child brides and how TLC now has a tie to Tony. Let's get into it. In this world so full of darkness, many people lose their way, never thinking about tomorrow. When you think of cult leaders, you may think of the very well-known ones, such as Charles Manson, Jim Jones, and David Koresh. Cult leaders are usually very charismatic and appoint themselves as the leader of the cult. Tony Alamo was, in my opinion, a cult leader. I mean, how he got people, especially parents, to believe that their children being Tony's child brides was an honor is an example of him being a cult leader. No parent in their right mind would be okay with this, at least I hope. But before we talk about the cult, who was Tony Alamo? Before Tony changed his name, he was named Bernie Lazar Hoffman. He was born on September 20th, 1934 in Joplin, Missouri. From what I've seen so far, there is less information about Tony's upbringing than his wife's, but from what we do know, his father was a Jewish immigrant from Romania. Tony, aka Bernie, at the time left Missouri for Los Angeles. Of course, he went there to be able to make it big. He decided to go by the name Marcus Abad, along with Mark Hoffman, and did end up having some success as a singer. Eventually, he would go on to work within the music industry and would own the Little Mark, 
Alamo and Talamo Records record labels. He did serve jail time for a weapons charge sometime before 1966, and after that is when he married an aspiring actress by the name Edith Opal Horn, also known as Susan Alamo. They both changed their names at this time to Tony and Susan Alamo. Well, actually, let me rephrase that. Some sources say that they changed their names together at the same time, while others say Tony changed his even prior to marrying Susan. However, Susan wasn't his first wife, and according to one source, Tony had actually been married four times prior to Susan. After Susan, he would remarry two more times between 1986 and 1990, in addition to a lot of disgusting, I, I don't even know what you could call it, situations, relationships, uh, spiritual wives, whatever they want to call this with literal children, but we'll be getting to that a little bit later in this video and more in depth in part two because it is a lot to go over, especially because some of the child brides actually came out later in life and talked about what went on, how it was, and everything of that nature. But since I've given a brief overview of Tony, let's go ahead and talk about Susan. And now, Tony Alamo to sing, Jesus is the only way. You know, I love to hear Tony sing. I'm Tony's great fan. And every song that he sings, the gospel songs, I love them all. There is a lot more information out there about Susan and a really great video that's actually a two-part series about this whole entire topic by a creator named Summer Sanchez that I'll leave linked below, but in this video, I'll only be giving a brief overview. Susan Alamo was born as Edith Opal Horn on April 25th, 1925 in Alma, Arkansas. Some sources state that she did convert from Judaism to Christianity and before before she met Tony, she became an evangelist, while other sources state they converted to Christianity together. She had been married twice and even had a daughter that would go with her to Hollywood so that Susan could try to make it onto the big screen. Susan didn't really have much luck with Hollywood, so what did she do, you may ask? Well, she decided to scam churches into believing her to be a missionary in need of money, which is quite the foreshadowing if you ask me. While I don't go to church or practice anymore, I was raised Catholic, and I don't think that you need religion in order to know that scamming anyone is unethical. And some may argue that the church is scamming people, and while that may or may not be true depending on who you talk to, in my personal opinion, two wrongs don't make a right. This does kind of paint a picture of Susan being okay with scamming others and using religion or spirituality to do so. However, she would go on with her husband, Tony, to not just scam others, but start a cult that wouldn't end well. Not that many of them do, but people have known Scientology is a cult for years and they're somehow still operating. Now that you know a brief little background about Tony and Susan along with how they met, let's move on to why I wanted to make this video and that is because of the cult they created. According to ArkansasOnline.com, they stated, quote, while in a business meeting in Beverly Hills, Alamo claimed Jesus came to him and told him to preach about Christ's second coming. He and Susan, who was also of Jewish descent, converted to Christianity and began a Hollywood street ministry, preaching particularly to addicts and sex workers. In the mid-1970s, they moved the ministry to western Arkansas, where Susan Alamo had grown up, end quote. Let's rewind a bit, though. Tony and Susan founded the Alamo Christian Foundation in 1969 in Hollywood, California. The Music Square Church was the name, but let's just call it what it is, the cult. It did have some controversy in its early years. This was due to members actively trying to recruit people in Hollywood, while their building was located about an hour away and it was isolated. Isolation is important to these cults and cult leaders because if they can isolate you, it's even easier for them to indoctrinate you. Add some love bombing and fear mongering to that isolation and you have the perfect recipe for control and your cult. Anyway, the members who were recruiting would take these potential new members back to the church in Agua Dolce. This is so that they could bring them to the evening services, which also included a meal. 
Tony Alamo's Pentecostal theology was a mix of paranoia and anti-Catholicism. He claimed that the Vatican had so much power that they were controlling the White House, the United Nations, and the media. He did publish his theories in something called the Vatican Moscow Washington Alliance. In this, he talked about the Vatican in addition to how he believed UFOs were messengers from heaven and signs of the end of times. What is it with these cults not only going to extremes but talking about the end of times and even the Heaven's Gate cult believed that they could transform into aliens. This might all sound very intense and for non-cult members it's easy to identify that this is not right but once you're indoctrinated you'll believe whatever your beloved leader tells you. If we do go back to Heaven's Gate or let's even throw Jonestown into the mix they were able to convince their followers to unalive themselves. According to the Encyclopedia of Arkansas they stated quote communal living was a staple of the Music Square Church The church quickly expanded its holdings, buying several businesses and establishing a compound in nearby Saugus. Members usually lived in a commune and worked at an Alamo-owned business, turning over much of their salaries to the church. With the labor of their followers, the Alamos turned their church into a hefty financial empire, even as many members had to scavenge food from supermarket dumpsters and were forbidden from flushing the toilets more than every two or three days." End quote. Tony and Susan decided to build their main branch of the Music Square Church near Dyer, Arkansas, which at the time the population was 486, according to one source. Quote, in Dyer, the Alamos moved into Susan's childhood home and began remodeling it with materials shipped in from Hollywood. The couple was fond of red carpeting, chandeliers, and velvet wall coverings and installed them in every space they occupied. At this time, they also began construction on a sprawling Victorian home on the mountain, complete with dormitories for their followers and a heart-shaped pool for Susan. A grand church hall was constructed for their evangelical TV show, where Tony regularly sang love songs for Susan, such as my personal favorite, I I love you so much it hurts. Then they set to expanding their empire in the neighboring town, Alma. Once it was all said and done, the Alamos owned 30 businesses in a town of 30,000, including a supermarket, western store, restaurant, a candy factory, and hog farm. In President Bill Clinton's autobiography, My Life, he talks about a trip he made to the Alamo restaurant to see Dolly Parton perform and describes Tony Alamo as Roy Orbison on speed, end quote, which is absolutely wild to me knowing that even Bill Clinton knew about Tony. How did no one look into Tony and his cult earlier? But... Anyway, eventually they would change the name to Holy Alamo Christian Church, which in my opinion makes more sense for the facade they were putting on for their cult. But the name would change yet again to the Alamo Christian Foundation. What would a cult leader be without exploiting his followers when it came to working for the cult? Well, Tony eventually started a number of businesses, and as you probably guessed it, this was for barely, if any, pay. So not only would Tony indoctrinate them into this cult, but he'd also have control over their finances in a sense, which is financial abuse. Since I'm throwing around the term cult, I wanted to stop here and say that you should look up the Byte model by Stephen Hassan. In this, he did also collect information and research done by other cult experts such as Leon Festinger, specifically his cognitive dissonance theory, along with Robert Lifton's Eight Criteria of Thought Reform and Margaret Singer's model from studying brainwashing in the 1950s. However, if you find cults interesting, I highly recommend checking out the Byte model and everyone else's model that I just mentioned. BITE stands for Behavior, Information, Thought, and Emotional Control. I've gone over this on my channel quite a number of times, so I will leave it linked below for those of you who may be new here. But let's get back to today's video. After a few years, the cult would start another compound in Nashville, Tennessee. The cult would build more churches, as they called them, in Chicago, Brooklyn, and Miami. If we go back to the Dyer, Arkansas location, this is where Susan was actually raised, but they grew their cult to several hundred members. Not only that, but while opening businesses, as already stated, they had printing facilities, a school, a tabernacle, and they even operated a rehabilitation facility for substance abuse, which is just mind-blowing. You know, Sharon, with addicts, with drug addicts, it's, it's about a year before they're really able to do anything. They have to, you know, you yeah, you right. came in the same way and yeah. your time was given to reading and praying and uh, was, was spent in the Lord. And they need that time. And we just, uh, 
we just keep going, you know, and, and uh, so many people getting saved and so many coming in and, and wanting to come in, we just have to turn people away continuously. There's just no way we can take them in. I know it. Now, you're teaching school now. Yeah. Now, what do you tell your pupils? <laughs> I tell them, uh, you know, I tell them the Bible. I tell them the Word of God. And I'm so happy and so thankful that I'm able to do that because uh, I see these little faces, these little kids that would otherwise have had to go to public schools where they preach evolution and every other kind of amoral and ungodly thing. And I can see how their lives have been twisted up like mine was and, and completely lost in, in misery and in sin. And in there in our school, we preach the Bible. We, we tell them the Word of God. We tell them about creation, you know, how the Lord really created the earth, not this evolution garbage, you know, this... Uh, or the humanistic uh, side. You know, if you right. tell children that they derive from animals, they're going to act like animals. That's right. This cult really knew what they were doing because the rehab center was most likely saying they were helping people when in reality, in my opinion, of course, they were taking advantage of vulnerable people. Some of these people were at their rock bottom and now they're being helped. And I'm saying that helped part sarcastically. So it's so easy for these people to rope them into the cult. I'm sure some of the things that may or may not have been promised would be something along the lines of housing, community, maybe even a job even though as I've already gone over and as I will go over further in detail later, the job portion or the job aspect, it didn't really pay well, if anything at all. So I'm not sure if that would have been thrown into the mix, but maybe. But something that for some people straight from rehab may not have because of hitting rock bottom. So that would seem very enticing to a person in that situation. Not to mention the printing facilities, which I'm going to assume also printed articles for their followers and a school to go ahead and indoctrinate the children at a very young age so they don't use or even get taught critical thinking skills. This is all starting to sound eerily similar to Scientology. Now let's talk to Gail Bingham. Gail, how long have you been at the foundation? Uh, nearly four years now. Nearly four years. Yeah. What was your life like before you came to the foundation? Oh, my life was miserable before I, I came to know Jesus because I, I see I grew up in a Jewish home back in New York City and I wanted to know about God, but I could never find any answers in the synagogues. And when I was about 11, 12 years old, I got involved with drugs in, on the streets of New York. And I got, was involved with drugs for over 12 years of my life before I came out to California. I was out in the streets for so many years dealing drugs lying, stealing, cheating, and I was just miserable. I was looking for something that, some, some sort of truth. I was looking for some sort of standard to follow, so, some adult to show me the way. And when I came out to California, I was 23 years old, and I felt like I was an old woman. I felt like I'd lived 100 years. And I came out here, and, and never once did I ever hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I lived in the biggest city in the world, and nobody was out on the streets. Nobody, was, nobody ever told me about Jesus, that he died for my sins, that I could have life. And I came out here, and I, I just thank God that you and Tony were out on the streets, that you had, had all those kids out on the streets to tell me the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I heard it, when I, I realized that I was a sinner, when I realized that I'd sinned against God and broken his commandments and his laws, I came to the cross, and I humbled myself before him as a child. And I just said, God, I, I don't care what I have to do. Whatever it is that's on my soul, take it away because I didn't want to be alienated from God anymore. Before we get into more about the downfall of this cult, I want to go ahead and stop and talk about Susan and her death because I truly think Susan's death is one of the reasons Tony spiraled even more and did even worse things. You know, Tony, I don't believe that during that period of time that God was ever any more real to me or Christ was any closer to me than he was during that period of time. About 1974, 75, somewhere along in that period of time, I talked to you people out there about having terminal cancer. An interaction I haven't mentioned before was something that was said in an interview that Susan's daughter did back in 2008 with the Southern Poverty Law Center. During this interview, her daughter stated that she was there when Susan met her match, which was Tony. If you remember from earlier, I stated that Susan made money at one point when it was just her and her daughter by scamming churches. Well, it was stated that when Susan met Tony, her daughter said, quote, 
I'm watching them and it's like a tennis match of horse crap. They both think the others got money, end quote. Susan used her pickup line, which was, quote, Tony, I've got to ask you a question. Did you know that Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again? End quote. Tony responded with, quote, why, yes, Susan, I do. But how did you know? End quote. And Susan responded with, quote, well, let's go up to my apartment and talk about it, end quote. It's mind-blowing to think that that's how it started. However, Susan would pass before Tony, and it's been said that after Susan, Tony kind of spiraled. There were articles that I read that in the future, Tony would ask a future wife to get surgery to look like Susan. But let's get back to Susan's death. In 1975, Susan was diagnosed with cancer. Quote, I am the Lamb of God, end quote, Susan would say on their show. When Susan was a child, she almost died from tuberculosis. It's been said that when she almost died, she was visited by angels and she was suddenly healed. Believe what you want, as long as you're not hurting anyone, but it's quite the coincidence, unless she wasn't actually dying and the story was over-dramatized a bit due to her scamming ways. Susan isn't here to confirm or maybe even deny anything, so we'll never know for sure, but since she scams so many people and then started a cult with her husband, I'm leaving more towards possible over dramatization. Well, because Susan told Tony about this, this is why they moved to Arkansas, as I stated earlier with some of their followers. In 1982, her cancer did get worse. On April 8th, 1982, Susan Alamo would die at a local hospital. Of course, Tony believed that she died due to the members of the church not praying hard enough. Tony was so sure that Susan would rise from the dead. Because Tony believed that she would be resurrected, instead of burying Susan, he took her embalmed body that he dressed in her wedding gown back to the dining room. He forced his followers to pray around her 24-7 to bring her back from the dead. Tony even had a woman by the name Shirley Lovett, who was a local florist, deliver flowers almost daily. According to one source, they stated, quote, In a 2008 interview, Elijah Frankievich remembers Susan's death. I believed 100% that she was going to rise from the dead. Tony talked publicly about the resurrection and local radio stations made fun of him by playing Wake Up Little Susie over and over. She said that week after week, they would be forced to lay down and curl up with the rotting corpse. She smelled. She was cold and really, really hard. She was dead. Every day that Susan remained dead, the children were beaten. Finally, after six months of no luck, an exhausted crew of cult members finally placed Susan in a newly constructed mausoleum on the grounds. Elisha was devastated and remembers laying on the mausoleum, still praying for Grandma Susie to rise. End quote. The Bible states that the legal age for marriage is at puberty. I'm not married to any teenage girls who don't want to be. I'm 74 years old. I don't remember oh, reading yeah. that in the Bible, sir. And I went to I, I went to Bible class every Sunday, Sunday school, and I don't remember saying anything well, about it. I mean, kids are reaching you puberty you at the age anything. of 12. You don't know anything about the Bible. So you, you, you just talk. You want to interview me, or you just want to yap your stupid mouth off? All right, Tony. Now is a part of the video where we get back to Tony. Just as an FYI, all of the following information has been taken directly from the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. If we rewind a few years before Susan's death in 1976, the U.S. Department of Labor charged Tony for violations of the Fair Labor Standard Act. This was due to some of his followers reporting him due to Tony not issuing checks and not paying via money, but offering something else. In my opinion, he was trying to barter with his employees when they wanted to be compensated monetarily. Well, he lost the suit and the appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1985. This same year, the IRS retroactively revoked the tax-exempt status for the church for the year 1977 to 1980. This was due to the IRS deeming them a church in disguise. Judge Larry L. Namoroff ruled that the organization operated for Tony's and Susan's benefit. Some of the property was seized by the IRS. Then if we fast forward to 1994, June 8th to be exact, he was convicted on one charge of filing false income tax return and three charges of failing to file a tax return. The total income the church had was $9 million during the three years that Tony didn't pay taxes, not to mention the $5 million that was owed 
to former church members for unpaid work. Tony would go on to declare bankruptcy. Just a few months later, in September 1994, Tony was sentenced to six years in the Federal Correctional Institution in Texarkana, Texas. Well, he would be transferred to a halfway house in July of 1998 and then was released from said halfway house on December 8th, 1998. While all of this was going on, of course, other things started coming to light. Quote, acting upon reports of child abuse on March 25th, 1988, sheriff's deputies raided the California compound in order to reunite three boys with their natural fathers. The fathers had been members of the Arkansas compound, but had been excommunicated. Their wives had remarried more loyal subjects of Alamo, and their families had relocated to California. U.S. District Judge Morris Arnold, finding that they had indeed been abused, later awarded damages to the boys in question. Alamo claimed that he and his followers had no assets and were living hand to mouth. He also apparently issued a death threat against Arnold, though he was later acquitted of that charge. One of the fathers, Robert Miller, had previously overseen the church's trucking company and alleged that Alamo had embezzled $100,000 from it. In 1990, Alamo failed to appear in court to answer these charges and was ruled guilty in default, end quote. It's absolutely heartbreaking that the abuse happened, but I am so happy that these ex-members fought back and got their children back and away from this environment and this cult. I can't imagine what kind of trauma they may have endured. And remember the whole situation with Tony believing and forcing his followers to believe that Susan was going to be resurrected, so he kept her embalmed body in the dining room for six months before putting her in a mausoleum. Well, this was back in 1982, and in 1991, Tony had told his followers to leave the Arkansas compound and take Susan's body with them. This was before a federal raid happened. I guess he knew what was to come because a judge ordered Tony to return the body in 1995 to Susan's daughter. Federal judge has been threatened. My mother's body's been stolen. Her body was finally returned in 1998 after a three-year legal battle. I just can't believe what Susan's body had to go through. Granted, yes, she was deceased, but first she's put on display for six months. Then she finally gets put in a mausoleum. Following that, she is moved. And then after a three-year battle, she's finally returned to her daughter and put to rest for good. Now, this next part is going to be a bit disturbing to listen to for some people, but following Susan's death, there were some controversial and and downright criminal marriages. It was said that Tony had child brides, some as young as eight years old, which is absolutely disgusting on his part. He did take these children across state lines, so one could say that Tony was sex trafficking these underage girls, that is even more disgusting and disturbing. And I'm also using the term wives very loosely because they were called spiritual wives. And I'm going to go over the child brides in part two because some of them did speak out and I would like to go over their stories. In addition to calling children wives was Birgitta Gillenhammer. Birgitta was a Swedish native and married Tony on June 23rd, 1984 in Las Vegas. The marriage didn't last very long, two years to be exact. Brigitte would go on to later say that Tony wanted her to get plastic surgery to look like Susan and that Tony abused her. She claimed that he regularly beat her and drugged her. I'm not sure where this number came from, but even though Brigitte was Tony's supposed third marriage, that wasn't correct. Brigitte was actually his sixth wife. Then between 1986 and 1990, he remarried twice. Once he was released from prison in 1998, he went back to being the head of the Tony Alamo Christian Ministries, even if it was a smaller organization by that point. He would go on some radio stations and say that what the government was doing to him by sending him to prison was the works of Satan. I mean, of course, this is what he would say, because how else would he explain getting into trouble and not having God on his side to keep him up on the pedestal he put himself on with being a leader of his cult? In the same article where all of this information is from, it talks about how Tony's followers would continue to have flyers and printed literature distributed across the U.S. and beyond, in addition stating that the material printed was disturbing and controversial, which the reason why I even bring this up is because this is something that still exists to this day. If you would like, I'm going to put some of the reviews from Google up on the screen. You can go ahead and pause and read them, but some of them are just really 
really intense. A lot of them do talk about these flyers that they get on their cars or on their windshields rather and how it's just a waste of time on their part and things of that nature. But on September 20th, 2008, Tony's compound in Miller County was raided due to an investigation into allegations of child abuse and CP. Then, a few days later, on September 25th, Tony was arrested in Arizona. This was due to a federal warrant that was charging him with violating the Mann Act, which is a federal statute that was put into place to stop trafficking women or girls across state lines over a period from March 1994 to October 2005. During the trial, there were several women who testified that they had been sexually abused by Tony and some being forced to be his wife. Some as young as eight years old and Tony was eventually found guilty on July 24th, 2009 on 10 counts of taking underage girls across state lines for sex. On November 13th, he was sentenced to 175 years in prison and also was fined $250,000. In February of 2014, a Miller County judge awarded $525 million in actual and punitive damages to seven former members of Tony Alamo Christian Ministries. Tony Alamo would die in federal custody in North Carolina on May 2nd, 2017. Okay, Tony, why don't you tell us why do you think the feds are trying to harass you and why would they accuse you of child and take uh, six children from your compound? Because this is what I've accused the federal government of and the Vatican. The Bible states that the legal age for marriage is at puberty. I'm not married to any teenage girls who don't want to be. I'm 74 years old. I don't remember I, reading that in the Bible, sir, and I went, to, I, I went to Bible class every Sunday, Sunday school, and I don't remember saying anything well, about it. I mean, kids are reaching you puberty you at the age anything. of 12. You don't know anything about the Bible. So you're telling me oh, the people that are 12 years old should be able to marry a 40 year old and that's okay what do you say you're saying that it's okay for a 12 year old to marry a 40 year old as long as she has well, reached in the puberty Bible, if you read the book of jasher you'll see that rebecca was 10 years old when she married uh Isaac was 40 years old. I know, but that's not the law today. Tony Alamo and the Alamo Christian Foundation may or may not be names that you know or have even heard of. In my opinion, this is actually a cult, and Tony is the cult leader. All right. Let me ask you another question. The Southern Poverty Law Center, which monitors the activities of extremist groups in the United States, uh, describes your ministry as a cult. Yeah. How, how would you respond to that? I respond that the Vatican is the cult. I am very scriptural with the Bible. Anyone that is not scriptural with the Bible, such as yourself, are a cult. Okay? The Lord is right and everybody else is wrong. If you watch part one, Tony has passed away, but his cult still exists, just not the same as it once was. In part one, I discussed Tony and Susan Alamo, the rise and fall of their cult, how Tony spiraled out of control after Susan's death, and how he got caught. If you've ever seen the jackets that are currently on the screen that have been worn by celebrities such as Michael Jackson, Dolly Parton, Miley Cyrus, and Nicki Minaj, well, those were made by Tony's followers and said followers didn't get paid for their work. As I also mentioned in part one, Tony would have child brides. So these are some of the things that I will be discussing in today's video, which is part two of my Tony Alamo and his cult series. As mentioned in part one, Tony Alamo had child brides. According to one source, quote, ex-followers say that by the late 1990s, Alamo was living in this sprawling compound with more than a dozen women, some of whom he called his spiritual wives, end quote. Which basically means there was no legal documentation binding these spiritual wives to Tony. There are a few women I'd like to mention in this section. However, we are going to go over Amy Eddy and Pebbles Rodriguez first. These two women actually came up with their own secret way of communicating with one another, and that was with their eyes. 
They would make eye movements to spell letters of the alphabet. Pebbles said in an interview with People, quote, This sounds really ridiculous, but we had to literally write the alphabet with our eyes. We had to come up with our own code just to communicate, end quote. Amy says, quote, It was our way of supporting each other, end quote. Pebbles and Amy were two of the child brides that Tony Alamo would have. Pebbles was 12 and Amy was 14. Tony was 62 at that time. The two of them talked about how for a decade during the 90s, both of them were raped, beaten, and starved by Tony. According to the People article, Tony's behavior grew more sadistic as the years went on. Pebbles and Amy were freed in 2008, and this was when Tony was arrested and charged with 10 counts of interstate transportation of minors for illicit purposes. In 2018, Amy and Pebbles did share that they suffer from PTSD, and Amy stated, quote, every day is a milestone, end quote. Pebbles agrees with Amy and talks about how she has recurring nightmares. Pebbles and Amy did go on to live their lives and even have children. I truly wish both of them the best and hope that they are able to work through the abuse and the trauma that they both endured as children. I did find another article, but it's older than the article I found in People, and I do believe that the Amy in this older article may be the same Amy I've already gone over, but her last name isn't listed, so I can't confirm that. I'm still going to share Amy's part of this other article because there is more in this older article. So let's get into it. This article talks about the stories of Jean, Amy, Nikki, and Desiree. Quote, Jean says that when she was 15 years old, Alamo, who was 59 years old, and her pastor at the time, forced her to become his spiritual wife and have with him. Amy says Alamo made her say vows and submit to his sexual desires when she was 14. Then Alamo did something that reportedly shocked even his most devoted followers. Desiree says Alamo made her his youngest spiritual wife when she was just eight years old. Desiree says Alamo then forced her to have sex with him. Nikki says she was 15 years old when she realized Alamo planned to make her his next wife. Nikki escaped the compound and fled before Alamo had the chance to act. Jean, Amy, and Desiree say they lived as Alamo's wives for years and endured before they were able to leave. They eventually fled the compound and left the church that once ruled their lives, end quote. Tony tried to justify having child brides by saying the Bible implies that puberty is the age of consent. Uh, the Bible states that the legal age for marriage is at puberty. I'm not married to any teenage girls who don't want to be. I'm 74 years old. I don't remember reading that in the Bible, sir, and I went to I, I, I went to Bible class every Sunday, Sunday school, and I don't remember saying anything about it. I mean, because kids are reaching you puberty you at the age of 12. You don't know anything about the Bible. So you're telling me the people that are 12 years old should be able to marry a 40-year-old and that's okay? What do you say? You're saying that it's okay for a 12-year-old to marry a 40-year-old as long as she has well, reached in the puberty? Bible, if you read the book of Jasher, you'll see that Rebecca was 10 years old when she married... Uh, Isaac was 40 years old. I know, but that's not the law today. And, and we don't see 10-year-olds <laughs> getting married. God, Let's face it. God, the law of God never changes. 10-year-olds year, ten shouldn't be married. Let's just say that. And they should be oh, waiting well, a lot longer that. before that, they spend the rest believe, of their lives with every, an adult. I, hey, All right. look at you. You're just talking. You want to interview me or you just want to yap your stupid mouth off? All right, Tony. There was an interview he did with Rich Sanchez from CNN in 2008 where he says, quote, I don't know when girls reach puberty. Most of them around 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. God inseminated Mary at the age of around 10 to 12. Should we get him for having sex? End quote. Well, if that's what Tony believed, that with using 10 as what seems to be the earliest age, why did he have an eight-year-old as a bride? He was just using this as a way to justify that it was okay for him to be, in my opinion, of course, a pet. Mr. Alamo, uh, thanks so much for being with us, sir. Oh, it's my pleasure. Prosecutors are saying that you are a polygamist who preyed on married women and girls in your congregation. That's what prosecutors have said on the record. What is your response to that? Well, uh, even if I was a polygamist, which uh, I'm not, uh, what would be wrong with that when uh, the psalmist David, Moses, and Abraham, and uh, Solomon and uh, Gideon and all those top people in the Bible, you could read about them in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, that they uh, were uh, polygamists as well. 
And uh, but well, well the, 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 the Bible, sir, is a, is a, is a, uh, a collection of stories, some of them to be used literally when they involve uh, God's word, hey, hey, and, and some man, to man, be used man, other ways. Man. But, but oh, there, there were also people who were stoned in the Bible. Or you think you have the right to do that now? Uh, don't tell me about the Bible, man. I'm a Jew. I, we wrote the Bible. Let me teach you. Okay. You don't know anything about the Bible, okay, All right. friend? All right? So you're saying the uh, Bible gives you the right to have sex with girls? Uh, I have the right to have sex with my wife. They're saying, for the record, that you have possibly either promulgated or had sex with young girls at your particular facility. Is that true or not? That is false. Okay. All right. You told the Associated Press that you're not guilty, but then you went on to say that, according to you, the age of consent is puberty. Puberty. Yeah, what, what do you mean by not, that? That's not according to me. That's according to Bible. That means... When a woman is able to conceive and have a child, she is an adult, and she could be married. But we don't do that at our church. We never have. Why would you be saying that, then? Well, because it's Bible. I have a right to preach the gospel, don't I? Okay? Well, but a, here's the problem. What kind of creep are you? Pu what? Puberty, puberty is a, as early as eight years old. Are you saying that you would be for children, as uh, young girls, as early as eight years old having sex? No, you're just trying to make me look that way. You're part of the government regime to try to destroy Christianity, and I didn't say that. I don't know when uh, girls be, uh, reach puberty. Most of them are around uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. God inseminated uh, Mary at the age of around 10 to 12. Should we get him for uh, having sex? Well, With yeah, yeah young well, girl. yes, yes. Huh? As a matter of fact, sir, if you go by the law, and we are a nation of laws, we should. And no, the laws specifically a, state not, that you have to wait. You're an, hey, you're not a nation of laws. You are the Antichrist. You're the exact opposite of the law of God. The law of God is what you're going to be judged by, and everybody else on this that, earth. That, that's fine, sir. But let me just let me just ask yeah, you. It's not for, only for, fine; it's going to really happen. Okay? okay. Well, thank you, sir. But for the record, are you, you saying that girls under the age of 18 should be allowed to have sex? I believe if they're married, that they could. As and, young as you know, what? As young as eight? As young as 10? As young as 12? Since no, that is in some eight, cases. Where, I'm not the one that sets the time. Like, when they reach puberty, I wouldn't just recommend that any 8- or 10-year-old girl uh, gets married. because. Uh, but in the event that it would be of the Lord, I would say it's all right. But I don't do that. Okay, so let's get that straight. I'm talking to you, to you from the Bible, what God said, and you're trying to make it look like I'm doing that. And that's Then why well. were those children... Uh do you have any idea why those uh, six children were removed from your uh, facility? They were removed because they just want to make a big deal out. They haven't found anything about them. They can check them for uh, 27 hours or 27 weeks or months or years, and they still will find out that they're virgin. Jean, Amy, Nikki, and Desiree went on to talk about how Tony made all the rules and how he even decided who got a driver's license and who was marrying who. Some of the cult members even said how it was an honor to be one of Tony's spiritual wives. That's why the parents of the child brides didn't argue with it because it was considered an honor. That or they just felt like they had no choice because the mentality was what Tony says goes. They were indoctrinated into this cult and while in my opinion as a parent myself, I can't understand why anyone would think it's an honor for your 8 to 14 year old daughter to marry someone old enough to be their grandfather, but I do understand indoctrination absolutely happens, but this would still be my breaking point. I'm usually more understanding and empathetic on my channel, but it is the parent's job to protect their children. Jean would talk about how when Tony would marry one of these young girls, she would have to, quote, fulfill his sexual desires. Tony Alamo has up to 13 wives, about, I would say, half were minors, and he had sex with every single one of us. He preferred the younger ones, end quote. Jean did believe that she was supposed to do whatever Tony wanted because God was talking to him. At her age especially, growing up within the cult, Jean really didn't know any better and her critical thinking skills were probably non-existent because that's usually what happens in cults. Remember when I talked about Tony having an eight-year-old bride? Well, that would be Desiree. She was eight years old and even though she did think highly of Tony, she still felt like being his bride and having sex with him wasn't right. Quote, 
I just remember Tony bringing me into his room at one point. He laid me down on his bed, said the marriage vows, said I do, and got a wedding ring. And after that, what actually made it final was instead of a marriage license, you had sex. I didn't know about sex. I didn't know about any of that. What kept going through my mind was, how can this be right? Isn't this wrong? End quote. One of the other women who spoke out was Nikki. In 1999, Nikki ran away after finding out she was the next in line to be a child bride. She felt like Tony was wrong. Quote, I thought if this is heaven and this is what's going to get me to heaven, I'm going to have to go to hell. End quote. As many would be, she was scared to run away. I would be too. You're taught a certain type of way of life and to be afraid of the outside world, but you also don't agree with what's going on within the cult. Nikki talked about how one afternoon she decided that was it. She was going to escape the cult, and she did. The only issue is Tony sent people to look for her. They were looking everywhere. Every highway, every store, every fast food place, you name it, and they were most likely there looking. Nikki finally saw a house after running for quite some time and went up to the door. I really can't imagine the fear and just every emotion that was going through her at that time. Fear of the unknown, fear that she was going to get caught, and if she did get caught, what would happen to her. I'm sure she was also upset that she had to escape in the first place. No one was there to protect her from this evil person that was Tony, and she left people she most likely cared for behind, so maybe she even felt guilt that she was able to get away. I'm sure Tony was more worried about her contacting police or whoever, really, to tell them what he was doing. He probably didn't care about her well-being or anything. Who knows what would have happened to her had she gotten caught. Well, Nikki finally found a house after running for miles. Vince and Karen Coker were the owners of the home and decided to ask her to stay the night. They obviously helped her by giving her some fresh clothes and a place to sleep. And Nikki says, quote, I remember laying there in bed. I felt a little bit safe. I thought, maybe, maybe they will really help me, end quote. Even though Nikki tried to make up a story, Vince and Karen didn't believe her story. So they did what they thought was right at the time and bought her a bus ticket to California. This was because Nikki's mom, Lisa, was living in California. When Tony had found out this news, he told Lisa that she should have Nikki arrested once she gets there. But thankfully, Lisa still had some kind of critical thinking left, and she did tell Tony that she wouldn't be able to do that. While I did say Lisa had some critical thinking left, it really wasn't much because Lisa just told Nikki to leave. Tony allowed Lisa to spend $50 on a bus ticket. Nikki said, quote, it was one of the saddest moments of my entire life. She put me on the bus and it absolutely broke my heart, end quote. Nikki would spend the next three months going all over the country looking for a place to stay. This was a child because she was a minor at the time who was homeless and escaping a cult. She had to do this with no support. I truly cannot imagine going through that and I hope that now as an adult, she's gotten the help she needs because in my non-expert opinion, that can traumatize a person. It hurts my heart reading about all of these girls having this happen to them. Well, the good news is Lisa is no longer a Tony follower or part of the cult. At least she admitted that she should have done more to protect her daughter and that she was wrong. I'm glad that she was able to admit that what she did was wrong, and while I do believe she was indoctrinated into this cult, she sounds to be at least trying to take some accountability. I can't say the same for other moms of these young child brides, because at the time of this article being written back in 2010, Amy and Desiree's families were still part of the cult, and their mothers even testified against them in court. Desiree did go on to say that her own mother doesn't believe what happened to her, which is odd considering Desiree became one of Tony's wives at the age of eight. She was there when all of this happened. The article finishes off with Nikki saying, quote, A lot of people lost their childhood and their innocence there. That's what I want people to see and to realize. Don't be so blind. Don't just say it's not my business. They're the neighbors. Hell was inside of there. I don't care if someone says it's not your business. Do you know how desperately bad we needed someone to poke their nose into something that wasn't their business? And no one did. End quote. I do hear what Nikki is saying, but I will say that I do mind my business a lot. You hear more people nowadays saying to just mind your business. Now, if I saw a child running and looking like she was in trouble, that would be 100% different. I don't like to parent shame, but in this situation, these parents suck. You're supposed to protect these children and these parents parents truly thought that their children being a child bride was an honor. What these children and now grown adults had to endure, the trauma they have is so heartbreaking. (laughs) 
Now we move on to the part of the video that actually sparked my interest into making this video to begin with. I was watching YouTube shorts and one showed up that was about the Tony Alamo jackets and how the guy in charge Tony was a cult leader. Then I found an article by Refinery and it solidified my decision into looking into this even more. Anyway, the Tony Alamo of Nashville jackets were assembled in a factory in Alma, Arkansas. This factory was originally a restaurant and according to the Refinery article, quote, first the raw denim was washed in a drum filled with stones and bleach, then it was cut and sewn into a shape. From there, a basic stencil, a skyline, or outline of a cartoon character was applied using a silk screen, and then the delicate work of airbrushing and embellishing could begin. Children manned the rhinestone station. Using their small fingers, they dropped row after row of Svadovsky stones into tiny fittings, end quote. Side note, I'm pronouncing Svadovsky that way because that's how I would pronounce it in Polish, and I'm not sorry if it bothers anyone, but anyway, back to the topic at hand. Can you imagine how horrible those working conditions had to have been with how popular the these jackets ended up becoming, children would place each Swarovski crystal piece by piece. That was definitely a long day, especially for tiny humans who should be spending their days learning other things and, I don't know, maybe having a childhood and maybe playing outside. I also wonder about how the employees, both the children and everyone else, were working with bleach. Did they have protective gear so that they weren't inhaling bleach all day long? day after day. Well, according to Refinery, they did mention that the working conditions were harsh, including bleach fumes from the washing drum, and how every day 150 people, which included men, women, and children, worked for as long as 14 hours a day. Sometimes the children's fingers would even bleed from some of the pointy rhinestones they worked with. Here's another bad thing about all of this. They weren't paid because this was their service to their cult leader, who was the only one who could show them the path to heaven. When it comes to Tony, I can't pinpoint if he actually believed his preachings and he was just taking advantage of people or if he was a full-blown scam artist who knew what he was doing the entire time. Or he could have also believed in his preachings a little bit and then he saw what he could do as a cult leader and just started scamming people and playing God. Benjamin Risha, who was born into the cult and grew up in the Alma compound, stated, quote, We really thought we were making these jackets for God. We really thought we were saving the world by making money for the ministry and spreading its word, end quote. But with all of that said, these jackets were popular in the 80s, which would make sense given the style of the 80s, flashy, acid wash denim, and just over the top. It's probably why the 80s are actually one of my favorite eras of fashion because it was just loud and in your face. Very expressive, I guess is another way to describe it. The jackets would also make their way back to popularity in more recent years as well. These jackets ended up being really popular among some big time celebrities. Some of these included Dolly Parton, Mike Tyson, Brooke Shields, Burt Reynolds, even a bit more recently was Miley Cyrus. And I say a bit because the photos I've seen her wearing these jackets were during her bangers era. These jackets have been worn by Nicki Minaj, ASAP Rocky, and Francis Bean Cobain. Well, one of the celebrities that had a customized leather version of these jackets was Michael Jackson. This jacket is the one he's wearing on the cover of his album, Bad, which means at the time this was a huge deal. And I mean, huge. All very well-known and popular celebrities who have set trends and the style of the jackets is my type of style and I actually have something similar that isn't made by cult members where the leader reaped the benefits 100% and is a fraction of what these jackets cost. In 1989, Tony Alamo gave an interview where he told the reporter, quote, The clothing is so groovy. Everyone wants it no matter what they think I am. No matter what, the superstars are going to want my jackets, end quote. And as we can see by the photos I shared just a few minutes ago of celebrities wearing the jackets, some of these were worn even after all of the information came out about Tony and his cult, along with him passing. So he was definitely right that the jackets would still be bought and worn after the information regarding how vile of a human he was was out. According to the LA Times in a 1989 article titled, Fugitive Cult Leader Alamo Sells Chic Jackets on the Run, they reported that the jackets were still selling for as much as $600 in boutiques and upscale clothing stores. Now remember, this is in 1989, so that's a lot of money. Nowadays, you can find these jackets on reselling sites, one of which is eBay, and at the time of writing this script, I saw one of the jackets for over $2,000, and one listing had a price of $11,000. 
dollars and this jacket was the supposed michael jackson jacket i wouldn't even know how to authenticate if it was the one that michael jackson owned but that's still very ridiculous for a jacket after knowing who the person in charge was. If you remember from earlier in the video when Tony was sentenced to six years of prison for failing to pay taxes in 1994, while well, the IRS, of course, seized assets from his properties in Arkansas, California, and Nashville. Part of the seized assets were hundreds of jackets, and the IRS auctioned these off along with everything else. In the Refinery article, they spoke with a tattoo artist named Josh Glasser. At the time of the article, he spoke about how he would collect and sell the Tony Alamo jackets. He stated that he was a teenager growing up in Baltimore in the 80s, and he saw the flashy drug dealers wearing them, and he wanted to own one one day. While knowing about Tony and his cult, Josh still liked the jackets. Benjamin Risha was 17 when he left the cult. He was actually born into it as well. He went through a lot of years worth of therapy and now speaks out against the cult. When the jacket started to become popular again, Benjamin did have some feelings about it. I mean, he was born into the cult and left at 17. He probably worked on those jackets, not to mention he escaped a cult. That's 17 years of indoctrination. I truly can't imagine what that was like, especially the moment he realized that he was in a cult, but I'm glad he was able to go through therapy. However, the reason why I bring him up is because he was interviewed for the Refinery article regarding the jackets. During the interview, after he was asked about the jackets, he said, quote, they do look awesome, right? End quote. After pausing, he stated, quote, I guess I would tell people wearing them, once you know where they come from, to try to go out of your way to help people less fortunate. Go to a place where women are battered or children need help. If you can afford the jacket, chances are you can afford to go help somebody, end quote. And I do agree with Benjamin. Maybe the people who go out of their way to buy these jackets don't know about everything else I've talked about in part one and part two. Maybe after they purchase the jackets, they do more research, but now it's already too late and they've already bought it. I think giving back, as Benjamin suggested, is a great idea. The last quote from Benjamin in the Refinery article is, quote, Tony hated losing and would do anything to appear as a winner, end quote. I'm not sure if any of you watching me also watch Cinnamon Toast Ken and Buff Pro. I bring Ken and Buff up because I watch TLC shows through them. One of which, Seeking Sister Wife, has casted a stepdaughter of Tony. Becky Ryan is actually Rebecca Kanim, who was born Rebecca Krupp. Her mom is Sharon Krupp. Sharon would marry Tony Alamo in 1989. Becky was about seven to eight years old when her mom married Tony, which is why the statements she makes on the show don't seem messed up to her, whereas for those of us who know it's a cult, may think her statements are alarming and, well, gross. Which is why I'm not shocked that so many people have vocalized that TLC did an awful job with casting. Becky was 16 when she married her, at the time, 19-year-old husband named Justin Kaneen. Some of her statements on the show included, quote, We weren't the first teens to get married young. Our church believed in polygamy as an option. My dad was the pastor of the church and he studied the Bible a lot. He got other wives as he was finding all the scriptures that prove that it is okay to do, end quote. Now, I will say that while I'm in a monogamous relationship, if there are people watching this who are in polygamous ones and all are consenting adults with proper boundaries and communication along with it not being a that's your choice, and even though I may not understand it, as long as others are happy and not forcing it on me, do your thing. However, I think many of us can speculate that Tony could have been doing this just to take advantage of women and young girls, and it wasn't the consenting polygamy that some people who maybe, if that's what you are and you would like to share in the comments, go right ahead, but... I do believe that Tony had nothing to do with that. It was more so he just wanted to take advantage of young girls and be a Becky did talk about how it was growing up in this dynamic. Quote, growing up in a polygamous household to me was never a negative. I guess sometimes I might have felt like, oh, my dad doesn't really have much time for me now, but then I also got other people to talk to, end quote. In addition, Becky did talk about how her mom wasn't close with the other sister wives. Quote, my mom's kind of a loner typically, so she didn't have a great bonding experience that I know I'll have, 
end quote. What's wild is that Becky was born into the cult, but she wasn't living in their compound, but her parents were part of the cult. Her biological dad, David Krupp, was a member of the Alamo Christian Foundation and was married to her mom, Sharon, from 1980 to 1988. They decided to move into a house owned by the foundation in Dyer, Arkansas. That was in 1988, and as you've probably put two and two together, everything started to go downhill after they moved. There was an article written by the Southwest Times record regarding the divorce and what happened when it came to custody. I'm going Going to read part of the article because there is a lot of good information in it. The title of the article says X Foundation Member Bitter. David Krupp watched with contempt as Tony Alamo walked away from the Washington County Jail in Fayetteville Tuesday afternoon. When I saw him walk out of there free, it made me sick, Krupp said. All I could think of was there's this man who has destroyed my life and taken my wife and daughter from me. Now he's got my daughter sitting on his knee and has kept me from her for three years without even a letter or a phone call. What a scum. Krupp's ex-wife, Sharon, is Mrs. Tony Alamo. The Krupps, they were married December 27, 1980, and they were divorced December 2, 1988 in Crawford County. After living in the Alamo Foundation housing in Dyer about two years, Krupp said, the couple had one child, Rebecca born on October 29th, 1981. Krupp said his wife's affections were alienated by Alamo. Sharon Krupp married Alamo in 1989. According to court records of the divorce, Krupp is to be allowed to visit his daughter every other weekend and holiday during Christmas vacation and six weeks each summer. Krupp said he has been down on his luck since the divorce and doesn't expect to get custody of his daughter, but that his visitation rights should still be honored. After the divorce decree, they've let me see Becky just once in California in a Denny's restaurant for about 10 minutes with a foundation worker, Krupp said. The last day I spent with her before the divorce, we ate Chinese food and saw Walt Disney, Snow White, and the Seven Dwarfs. Sharon called it evil and non-scriptural and an unsuitable movie for Becky. Krupp claims his ex-wife and Alamo are keeping his daughter in captivity out of public school and away from contact with outsiders and that the girl has been beaten by his ex-wife and foundation members. He said Tuesday he has volunteered to testify as a witness for the prosecution in the California child abuse case pending against Alamo. If I had the money to fight this in court, I would, Krupp said, but Tony broke me. Everyone in the foundation knew I was successful and wealthy before I moved in there. Krupp, a native of Los Angeles, said he first came into contact with Alamo's Tony and Susan Alamo Christian Foundation in Los Angeles, where Krupp said he liked attending church services led by Tony and Susan Alamo. In 1988, at his wife's insistence, he says he moved his family from Texarkana, where he was ready to open a jewelry store, to a two-bedroom foundation-owned house in Dyer. It was the biggest mistake I ever made, he says now. I lasted there about a year and three months before they kicked me out and confiscated all my jewelry and everything. Krupp said he was accused of taking money from the foundation, but that he had withheld nothing from Alamo. Krupp claims that taking someone into the foundation, getting all their worldly goods, then accusing them of stealing or some other trumped up charge, and then evicting them owning nothing is a common tactic of the Alamos. But wait, there's even more. I'm not going to accuse Sharon of anything because I'm not making this video to get sued. However, during her testimony during Tony's trial, she talked about how she knew that there were young girls living in the house, but she did not know of any marriages or sexual interactions between these children and Tony. Those of you watching can form your own opinions, but in my opinion, I don't really know what to think. I truly find it hard to believe that she didn't know. Maybe she also didn't want to get in any kind of trouble, whether it be legally or just with Tony. She could have also been afraid of Tony. At the end of the day, regardless of what my opinion or your opinion is about Sharon, these were still children. And Tony, in my opinion, was a groomer and For legal purposes, let me reiterate again, that's my opinion, not a fact. If all of this was happening in front of Becky, the indoctrination was strong with this one. Becky has no idea that this is not how it's supposed to be. Polygamy is not making children your brides and bringing them across state lines. That's called sexing, Becky. The actual definition that Google gives me of sexing is, quote, the action or practice of illegally transporting people from one country or area to another for the purpose of sexing. 
sexual exploitation, end quote. But I've seen people speculating that the reason why Becky and Justin are using the last name Ryan is because they're trying to conceal their actual last name, and Ryan is Justin's middle name. Knowing that little tidbit of information makes me wonder if Becky is aware that what Tony did is wrong and that she grew up in a cult. I don't think that concealing your name online is suspicious because a good example is people do it on YouTube all the time. However, in this particular situation, I do find it suspicious. What was TLC thinking when they were casting Becky? Did they not do their research? If it was so easy for the internet sleuths to find out their real last name and find out who Becky's stepdad is, then they A, didn't do a very good job concealing their name, and B, Clearly, researching the new cast members wasn't that hard and TLC really dropped the ball on this one. I'm Justin. This I'm is Becky. my wife. Oh. Oh. Who first? Me first or what? You first. You uh, I'm you Justin. First. This is my wife, Becky, and we're the Ryans. We've been dating Stephanie for close to nine months. She lives in a different part of the country. The second time she came out, she was like, All right, I really want to do this. She had already agreed to be our wife by that point. She's like, yeah, I'm gonna be with you forever. But then she kind of goes in these phases where she says, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And I'm afraid of what my family will say. She's dealing with a lot of anxiety and worry about what other people think about her. Because the thing about polygamy is it's not accepted. There's a stigma. It's not one of the boxes that, that you know, society approves of. She's kind of done her ghosting thing again, so. Yeah, we haven't heard from her to what, almost over a month, yeah. I mean, I really have no idea if it's the end of Stephanie in our lives or not. I love her like I loved Becky. To, to us, she was perfect. One thing I would like to say after researching this cult is I hope all of the victims are doing well in life. I know that's pretty generic to say, but I really hope that they all got the help they deserved and were able to go to therapy along with were able to eventually go on to live great lives. What Tony and Susan created together spiraled even more after Susan died, but I'm glad that they were both eventually exposed for the cult they were and ran. For those who still work for the cult and believe in Tony's teachings, I hope that they wake up one day and realize what they're actually a part of. But anyway, Thanks for watching, and this is Monica reporting to you live from a highway. Bye!